Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here, back for day two of the Greenskin Q&A, and for today we're going to be mostly still focusing on Greenskin physiology and like some of the species they work with and things of that nature, and I'm going to do my best not to say like six billion times <laughs> like I did yesterday, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So our first question today comes from Mosin Askery, who asks... Hey Sotek, uh, keep up the good work, here are my questions. Do female giants exist, and do they reproduce like humans? Do female trolls exist, and do they reproduce like humans? And I know green skins re uh, reproduce through fungi, how do they create more, and what factor decides the species and subspecies of them at birth? And then finally, are noblars re related to green skins? Okay, so most of these we've already answered, but the ones I want to touch on are trolls. So, trolls, uh, from what we can tell, do have gender. Well, there are female trolls. So, they seem to have reproduced just like humans do. They're, you know, mammalian creatures. And if you want to see particular instances of a female troll, you can either go to the Forge World website and see the River Troll Hag which river troll hags are huge river trolls. Like, they're they're female trolls, but they're massive compared to regular river trolls. And then if you read the Gotrek and Felix book, I think it's Orc Slayer, there's also, like, a mating pair of trolls that shows up uh, during a part of that book. And I think the rest of these we've already answered, so if you want to know any of those, you can just check out yesterday's video. Next up, we've got Mopman43 whose question is, I've heard that orcs get bigger and stronger by surviving fights. Is that true? And if so, does that apply to all the other greenskins? Could you get a really big noblar if it managed to live long enough? So, if a greenskin's in a really violent environment, but manages to keep like a steady supply of victory and food coming, then they will get larger as time passes. And that's universal for all greenskins. That being said, their growth is very gradual over time, and it takes years, decades, if not even longer, to make any like meaningful growth. Theoretically, if a Noblar were to somehow rally a war, you know, a wa around him or a war band, become a war boss and maintain that position for like two three hundred years maybe then yeah sure he would probably grow to a rather concerning size like he could probably get to be as big as larger goblins or fairly small orc which for a noblar would be huge but considering that <laughs> any noblar who started to get muscular enough to have any meat on their bones would be like immediately devoured by an ogre that's probably not gonna happen <laughs> you know unfortunately that uh that relationship between them and the ogres has a direct correlation to uh there's ogres don't let them get too big um so our next question comes in from charlie matthews who says what do greenskins do when they are first born so when greenskins are like when they first emerge from the soil uh around their birth rooms they essentially will come up and their bodies like immediately start kicking into action. So, you know, they breathe air for the first time and they get hungry. So they experience hunger and that is like the very first, there's one, <laughs> that's the first uh, feel sensation that they try and satisfy, which 90, 99% of the time results in them attacking one another and the weakest or smallest of their group gets devoured by all of the other ones. So you can find this uh, in like Skarsnik's... Two. <laughs> I'm going to stop counting. Uh, you'll find that in Skarsnik's novel. He kills one of his like spawn brothers and eats him. And most of the other runts focus in and eat the weaker ones. Skarsnik was very small for his group, but because he was a lot smarter than them, even like even the instant he came out of the ground, he was able to outwit a runt that was bigger than him and get a kill out of it so he could eat. 
because you know green skin culture is just the best so our next question which is which is a doozy comes from grant jacobson which to boil down what he's asking his big question is so for races that have green skins as a part of their faction like ogres or chaos dwarves do they have the ability to collect other green skins but kill them upon capture or discovery do uh do they have fungal farms that they personally control and therefore control like what kind of green skins they get and are they able to control that or do the green skin fungi only spawn the variants in particular circumstances and then finally he asks could a powerful enough caster like slon or the strongest of arc mages etc force dr green skin fungi into a monoculture so like creating like a specific type of green skin from a culture of mushrooms so this so green skin chaos dwarves we'll start with them chaos dwarves deal with all kinds of green skins they just have the hobgoblins as partners when it comes to fighting on the battlefield and all of the other types are enslaved and like kept in the mines and the slave pits and the forges and stuff but so it, it's not that greens it's not that chaos dwarves don't have access to all the other green skin types it's just that they don't trust any of them to be reliable on the battlefield with the exception of hobgoblins and even then like chaos dwarves don't really actually trust them like they don't give them weapons or armor or anything they just basically force them out onto the field and let them like run around and harass the flanks or run out in front and what the chaos dwarves are hoping is going to happen is that like the enemy will shoot all of their ammo at the hobgoblins to kill them all that way the hobgoblins will be out of the way and all their ammunition will be spent so none of the precious chaos dwarves die but um moving on from there green skins can only spawn if the correct spore type has been placed in that region and the conditions are suitable to produce the species in question so for instance if you went into the uh, caverns beneath like the southern mountains of morn um, or even just the ones that are fairly below the mountains of morn you're more than likely going to find birth shrooms that are really really good at producing noblars but really struggle to produce anything else unless they're like certain you know unless they're close enough to a volcano or something along those lines and this is going to be due to like a pit that's going to produce a lot of noblars might be doing that because it's so cold maybe due to the altitude maybe due to the amount of light that the mushroom is receiving and because it's mostly noblar spores that are down there that will mean that the crop i guess you could say that you're going to get is mostly noblars that being said you know all the types of green skins spawn in the mountains of morn for instance but in that area if you're not a noblar then you will be hunted and devoured by ogres with like extreme prejudice uh, especially like the big event that led to greece's gold tooth becoming the over tyrant of the ogres like and being recognized as the over tyrant by all the tribes was that there was a big wah starting up led by this huge black orc and greesus was having none of that and he put it down really really hard in this really big famous battle so at the uh, fire mouth so that's why you don't really see a lot of those other green skins it's just that uh, like for ogres the only reason they don't eat noblars is because they're particularly fond of noblars it's because they don't consider noblars a threat and they don't consider noblars worth the effort of eating because there's just like no meat on their bones and their level of assistance is better than just like wiping them out so they tolerate only that subspecies so you know those are kind of those two factions covered and other factions might have green skin slaves but they would never rely on them in a fight so like dark elves can have green skin slaves but even for Dark Elves, Greenskins make really not ideal slaves just because they're so violent. And, like, if there is going to be... It's difficult to break a Greenskin. 
Especially if there are any black orcs. Black orcs, like, are impossible to break. So you really... They tend to focus on, like... Damn it. They tend to focus on human slaves. That's just a lot easier. Beyond that, uh, final parts of this question are... Oh, right. About wizards. So, uh, greenskins, I should note uh, in some of your questions that greenskins do spawn variants in a lot of their... Uh, whenever you get like a, a, a group, a crop, I guess we can call it, or a birthing, there will be a number of greenskins that don't come out right for whatever reason. Like maybe they have some sort of mutation or they're not quite as good of stock or maybe they're a superior stock. And that can happen. But in most cases, greenskins tend to isolate, kill, and eat any of their species that don't come out right. So if they have any mutations, or maybe they come out particularly small, or they're missing a limb, or, you know, whatever it may be, most of the time they're going to get called out, um, either active, and actively, a lot of the time, when, when a runt group comes up, they're almost always, 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 always going to be noticed by whatever tribe controls that particular region, and that tribe usually will have active greenskins whose job it is to sort through the runts figure out which of them are worth keeping which of them aren't and then getting them organized and off to jobs and so they can start growing and stuff and they will literally go through them and be like that one's gonna get eaten like that one goes to the pot that one goes to the pot that one goes to the pot we'll keep all of these ones maybe that one is gonna get sent off to the shaman or like you, they just they figure all that out so it's very rare to see green skins come up that are very unique just because most of the time a tribe will not it's not good to stand out among green skins if you can avoid it there have been of course exceptions you know you have Skarsnik who was smaller than average and he kind of barely squeaked through but he was really intelligent so he was able to get around a lot of situations but in the Skarsnik novel, there's even a rather large goblin who was born in a cave that had warpstone in it. And because of it, not only is he did he mutate to be larger, but he has two heads. And normally, the greenskins would kill that thing instantly, but it was either the it was either the shaman duff skull or the leader of that particular tribe. I can't remember which one it was. One of them saw that he had two heads and was like, Oh, this goblin is blessed by Gork and Mork because he has twin heads. So leave that one alone. Nobody's allowed to kill him. And that's the only reason he was able to live. But, you know. As for the final question about influencing fungi through magic, it is possible, but it requires some really, really ugly magic. Like a slon isn't going to be able to use geomancy for instance to influence the fungi of greenskins into a particular monoculture to like harvest a specific breed or anything like that the only sorcerers in the entire world who have successfully tried who have tried and successfully gotten away with manipulating greenskin fungi are the chaos dwarfs which is how they created the black orcs and it ended up being a really, really bad idea <laughs> because they just created like a super breed of orc that they could not control. And it just about caused their empire to get wiped out. Um, like the Chaos Dwarves, the rebellion caused by the Black Orcs was so bad that the Chaos Dwarves only survived it because the Hobgoblins turned on the rest of the Greenskins because they th decided it would be better for them to turn on the greenskins and help the chaos dwarves and therefore reap the rewards of that relationship then participate in wiping out the chaos dwarves with all the other greenskins and stay where they were on the food chain which is why all the other greenskins hate hobgoblins so much it was like a really deep racial betrayal but that's why you know that's that whole thing so could it can it be done yes but it's very very hard to do and the Chaos Dwarves, it should be noted, are the most gifted race when it comes to manipulating life. And that's because they have a really strong 
mm, they're very gifted when it comes to demonology and using sorceries that literally rip out and mess with life forms and then basically shove them back into a physical form and see what happens. For instance, the Chaos Wars have created their own unique version of life, which are called the Kadai. Um, the, the Kadai are not demons inside of... The, the Kadai, if you ever see them, they look like fire demons that are locked into like these suits of armor. So when they're activated, like flames come out and they go crazy and attack everything around them. And a lot of people think they're demons, but they're not. They're actually a completely unique form of life that the Chaos Dwarves just created using a bunch of really crazy materials. So that's how they were able to pull that off. But you won't, <laughs> you know, you won't see anything. Um, I, I don't think any other race that would be powerful enough to be pull that off would be willing to use what magic would be necessary to pull it off. Maybe, you know, maybe the Skaven of Clan Mulder could pull it off if it weren't for the fact that green skins are way too difficult for Skaven to deal with. Or, you know, the... The, um... Necrarch bloodline of the vampire counts. Or the vampires. I bet they could pull it off if they had any interest in working with living flesh. But of course they specialize in necromancy. Which doesn't work with living subjects that well. Anyway, hopefully that answers those questions. Our next question comes from Juan Ahmad. Who asks, what does a green skin taste like? And I know this comes up in another question. But this hasn't been answered yet. So I'll go ahead and knock it out here. Would... Which is that uh, green skins, so the only reliable report we have about what green skins taste like is from Golgfag Maneater. Who of course is the legendary mercenary captain of the Ogre Kingdoms who's ridiculously famous. And he's traveled the entire world and met lots of different people and special characters. He's like met Karl Franz and even got an award from him. He's battled Ungrim Iron Fist twice. You know, he's done all sorts of crazy stuff. But he kind of had like a series of comments where he basically gave his thoughts on what his favorite meals are. And it's noted that um, he always detests being called man-eater because men are actually not his favorite meal by a long shot. His preferred is halflings. But a very close second for him are actually night goblins. Because what he says about night goblins is that night goblins have like an almost... He basically says they're like a very exotic, tough, sinewy, uh, like form of chicken. But the thing about them is because they eat so many shrooms, it gives them like this really exotic taste that has like a nice buzz to it according to Maneater. Granted, eating a green skin would probably not be good for a human... Uh, ogres have a little bit more reliable of a digestive system seeing as they can eat like actual lava and other crazy things of that nature from what stories I've read green skins do not taste particularly great like if any race has the option to pick between eating a green skin or eating pretty much anything else they're gonna pick anything else green skins are just filthy disgusting creatures night goblins seem to be moderately preferred by ogres as kind of like a nice exotic flavor but other than that n not a lot of good things to say forest goblins would definitely be a terrible idea to eat because they constantly imbibe spider venom in their venom and they're very toxic because of that and orcs i just imagine just don't taste good so <laughs> there's your answer to that weird question last defender of shodel asks i know i asked this way earlier but uh okay how powerful could a really powerful hobgoblin be? Like, what would a Grimgore level of dangerous hobgoblin look and act like? So, the most powerful hobgoblins you'll ever find, you have to go up to like the wolf, or you have to go up to the wolflands or the eastern steppes. Which I said steeps last episode, so I was like, no, you should say steps. So let's try saying steps. It, which are on the other side of the mountains of Morn. So if you're heading east into the dark lands you then run into the mountains of morn and then you go over those and there you'll find where like the main hobgoblin empire is 
which are these super scary nomadic tribes that are led by these legendary individuals known as the Hobgobla Khans, who are like, they are the masters of nomadic ranged warfare. It's rare to see them anywhere west of the Mountains of Morn, but sometimes their wolf riders will come west and will join up with the Chaos Dwarves for an expedition or be hired on as mercenaries. And among the Chaos Dwarves, when the when the Chaos Dwarves have a lot of hobgoblins that live with them, one of the hobgoblins of those groups will usually end up sell, calling themselves a con as kind of like a unit champion, but they're just like taking the name. It'd basically be like having a room full of children. One of them, or It's basically like having a high school in an anime and they're like, oh, I'm president, you know, it, it's it's not you're not actually president it's just you're president of a little thing uh you're not the big bad the big bad hobgoblin cons are really really scary they're known for you'll either find them riding their very impressive wolf chariots which they go from having the regular ones that you'll see with the green skins where you can fit you know like anywhere from two to four goblins on them to having these like massive platforms they're like they have huge siege towers on them that have all sorts of uh, goblin bolt throwers or hobgoblin bolt throwers, I guess in that case, and tons of archers. And you have you have 10, 20, maybe a few dozen wolves pulling each one of them. And they're these like giant ramshackle fortresses that roam around and you'd find one of the cons on there. But depending on the con, they might be on an individual chariot, they might be on one of the huge ones, or they might just ride like a particularly nasty giant wolf. But in any event, they specialize in being really, really deadly archers that just move at pretty alarming speeds. Most Hobgoblin cons would probably not prefer to get in like a one-on-one -on -one battle affair, but if you did somehow manage to force them to the ground into combat, a... Hobgoblin Khan would probably be roughly the size of an orc. He'd definitely be as tall as an orc, but he wouldn't be nearly as muscled. Like, they wouldn't have that big... They wouldn't have, like, the big ape muscles and the huge neck and tusks that you'll see on orcs. But it would definitely be as tall. Though, um, it would rely on speed and probably some really, really cheap, dirty tactics. Because if there's one thing Hobgoblins are infamous for... Is that they are the most degenerate jerks of the greenskin world. Outside of that though, um, it's worth saying the hobgoblins are the largest breed of goblin. So the hobgoblin Khan, a big scary one that was like Grimgore-esque among goblins, would be huge for a goblin. He would be much bigger. And in close combat, he would actually probably be fairly dangerous. Um, it's worth noting that... The hobgoblins do prefer wielding, they don't describe it super well, but they basically like using these really curved swords. And it explains the reason hobgoblins like these swords. Like, I'm not talking about curved swords as in like a scimitar. I'm talking about you have a blade that goes like out like a crescent. So I think maybe they're called crescent sickles or crescent blades or something like that. But hobgoblins literally really like them because... They get ones that are big enough that they can use it while fighting you to your face to stab you in your back. So he'd probably wield one of those, maybe a shield or a spear, probably have some throwing javelins and probably a really, really nasty bow or short bow. And his mount would either be a very packed wolf chariot or a really big, scary giant wolf. But ultimately... I mean, he is still a goblin, so taking him down in close combat would be the easiest way to deal with him. It wouldn't, you know, he's not... Scar Snake would be fairly easy to deal with in combat if it weren't for Gobla. But a Hobgoblin Khan isn't going to have a Gobla. Like, at best, he'll have a fairly scary giant wolf. But, you know, hopefully that gives you an idea of what a Grimgore-esque Hobgoblin would be like. Okay, Rusty Berenger asks a whole bunch of questions, so let's just hop into it. Okay, he asks, how did trolls come about? You know, are they related to greenskins or were they mutated through other means? Did Chaos Dwarfs create black orcs? We already answered that. Were the first black orcs better than the, mod the modern day ones? Uh, when the original spores came 
from the Old Ones vessels, were they considered part of the Great Plan? If not, why weren't they wiped out? And what story or book tells us about what happened between the Orcs and the Cow Stores during the end times? Because I'm struggling to find it. Okay, so Rusty, here's all your answers. First, trolls are not true greenskins. Trolls are, from what I can tell, trolls are likely natural creatures that already lived on the planet of the Warhammer world before the old ones came. Their ultimate origin is completely unknown. So we don't know, there's a chance they might have been some primordial species that got mutated when chaos came into the world, but they're so hyper adaptive and they don't have any natural chaos influence you know they're, they're just really hyper adaptive that's like their big thing is that they regenerate so much that whatever environment they're in they just kind of like take on aspects of it so there doesn't seem to be any evidence that they're alien in origin or chaotic in origin they seem to have just kind of always been here so that's that's unfortunately that's gonna be the best answer i can give but they don't do the whole spore thing they're not green skins they just tend to hang out with green skins as for which chaos uh oh and i think he asked which chaos dwarf specifically created the black orcs we don't know whatever chaos dwarf was personally responsible for the black orcs it's highly likely that he was either murdered by the black orcs during the rebellion or he was murdered by the priesthood of Hashut and sacrificed to the father of darkness immediately after the rebellion for his colossal failure i mean it was a it was a spectacular failure of an experiment as for with the old ones greenskins were never part of the great plan the greenskins were a complete accident that it apparently the old ones must have been at a some other planet where there were greenskins or maybe they created them a super duper long time ago and put them down as a failed experiment who knows but for whatever reason when the old ones showed up they had green skin spores on their ships so that means they must have come from some kind of great battle they had with the green skins and likely killed a ton of them and because of that the spores were introduced to the warhammer planet and green skin started to show up the green skins were actually the first one of the first major opponents of the lizardmen because the saurus were almost specifically created just to deal with the green skins so there was this mass extermination that the Lizardmen led across the entire planet and they wiped out 99, 95% of all the Greenskins. But the problem is Greenskins are so prolific and they, their spores are like really deep down in the earth and are and you have to use fire to wipe them out. Um, it is possible to wipe out Greenskin spores in their caves and stuff, but you need, you need a lot of fire. And the lizardmen just didn't have the technology or the knowledge of how to go down deep into the earth and go like systematically cave by cave by cave by cave burning everything to make sure the greenskins were dead they did wipe them out to the extent that by the time the demons happened or you know most of the younger races were created greenskins were a non-issue like they had basically been wiped out but after the Great Incursion was over and the Lizardman Empire was crippled, and so there was like just a ton of empty space, the Greenskins just exploded population-wise and became what they are now. As for the end times, so the raising, so Tsar Nagrund, which is the capital of the Chaos Dwarf Empire, and as long as it stands, they stand, was destroyed during the end times, and it was raised by Grimgor Ironhide. And it is, it is a super brief footnote in a novel called the lord of the end times so if you're reading through the end times and you have like all the really big books i don't even think they mention it but if you get there there were some novels that came alongside with each one of them so if you get a book that's specifically called the lord of the end times and it's book five that book has like a single paragraph that talks about the fall of the city because basically and the, the way it worked out was that grimgor essentially went home to Tsar Nagrund where he was presumably created or born and he went to take revenge on the Chaos Dwarves for A, their cruelty when he was there and it's highly implied that either during the rebellion or something along those lines is how Grimgor lost his eye 
Um, the Chaos Dwarves seem to be the ones who have taken... Were the ones that just destroyed it. So, with the help of Wurzag and Golgfag Maneater, who actually had joined up with Grimgore by that point, they were able to basically smash open... Golgfag managed to get the gates open at Tsar Nagrund, and then with Wurzag's help, Grimgore let his Wa in and just absolutely annihilated the uh, Chaos Dwarf Empire. Next question comes in from Thomas Weaver. We've already answered that. Just wanted, to know, wanted you to know I got your question, but we already answered it. Uh, Tambrin Bennett asks, I have a couple of weird questions, but I hope you, I hope to hear you reply to them. Since orcs are spores when reproducing, can they be modified? Uh, yeah. Um, those, that's exactly what black orcs are. Modified, modified spores. Then, and then he says, then if Grimgore, Krokgar, Durthu, and Ungrim were in the same part of the battlefield with the end times, how badly would chaos get messed up? So, I... If those four teamed up and were fighting side by side, whatever Chaos Legion would, was sent against them would have been super duper boned. But even with all four of them combined, and if they had like a full army behind them, they could even be empowered. I could give each one of them a Wind of Magic. You know, I could give Krokgar the Wind of Heavens, Grimgore the Wind of Beasts, Durthu the Wind of Life, and Ungrim the Wind of Fire. If I made them incarnates, gave them full armies, and put them up against Archaon's Horde, they would still lose. Just because that the sheer volume of Archaon's army and the power boost that he was given in the lore to make him appropriate for bringing about the end of the world were insane. Like, Archaon's strength at during the end times was bonkers. So... Although the four of them would have been incredibly powerful, I don't think they would have been able to save the world, even if they teamed up. It, you would have to have eight really, really powerful characters. Like, you would probably need Nagash in that mix. You'd probably need the Emperor, or like Karl Franz, Juiced Up, or Sigmar. You know, you would need some kind of really powerful elf. Like, it, it would take a lot <laughs> it would take a lot to even stand a chance against Archeon's full might. Even in the end, the original end times, when the eight incarnates teamed up, they teleported into Archeon's base and were so, and by doing so, were able to skip a massive part of his army. It was not physically possible for them to fight their way to him. So, hopefully that answers that. And then Aka Tamarian says what is the difference between night goblins and normal goblins the they're very similar you know there's they're they're cousins they're subspecies of each other so night goblins the big difference is with them is that they're almost exclu they are exclusively a subterranean species of goblin so they live underground under mountains usually and they have much better dark vision so they can see really really well if there's even a like hair of light Night goblins also specialize in squig breeding and handling and also deal with things like wyverns and trolls on a much more regular basis. Whereas normal goblins, which live, you know, on just regular land, out in the wastelands, under the sun and things like that, they rely much more on giant wolves as their primary partners. And then you have forest goblins, which are a whole other subspecies that live in forests and rely on giant spiders, arachnoroks, things like that. Also, regular goblins tend to create... If, when they're like making things, they tend to construct chariots and they tend to construct rock lavas and spear throwers. Whereas night goblins tend to create doom diver catapults because you usually need a doom diver... A doom diver... Well, actually... Dune Divers are more regular goblins, not night goblins, sorry. Because the reason I know, can say that for sure, is that, the funny enough, the Dune Diver Catapult's original design was it was a scouting device. So they would launch one of those goblins so that he could, like, see the terrain and do a scouting report. But obviously, as a scouting device, it was a total failure because the goblin would die every single time. <laughs> so, um, worked really, really well as a siege weapon, though. So, siege weapons... Chariots, wolf riders, normal goblins. Squigs, troll, most trolls, 
you'll see regular trolls with regular goblins, but most trolls, squigs, uh, heavy, you know, fair amount of the poison and subterranean warfare, night goblins and wyverns, night goblins. Uh, also, night goblins tend to be a little smaller than regular goblins, and they also hate sunlight. They call it the evil sun for good reason. All right, and then the uh, oh man, we're almost we're out of time. The last question, we'll do one last question for today, which is how big do squigs get? Is Gobla the largest squig in the lore? Uh, no, actually, some squigs get terrifyingly huge. Gobla, Gobla's big. He's what's called a great cave squig. So he's what I like to call monstrous infantry sized. So like if, if Gobla was a little less lazy and ate, you know, as much as he could and stuff, you could say he's vaguely troll sized. If a troll were to like sit, you know, obviously squigs don't stand up straight. They're more of like a big mass, but there are squigs that are the size of giants and they are thankfully rare, but obviously they're terrifying. And the largest of those are what we call colossal squigs. So colossal squigs, you are roughly the size of a giant, maybe a little smaller, but they are freakishly fast and they can bounce horrifying distances in a very, very small amount of time. And their mouths are so freaking huge that they can easily eat like multiple knights and their horses in a single bite like no problem get the horse the knight the lance everything just so there are some big freaking squigs out there but like i said thankfully they're rare i do hope we'll see the colossal squig at some point in total war warhammer it is in the forge world book which is where a lot of the really over the top monsters come from like the dread saurian and the morn goals so hopefully we'll see that eventually but in any event uh, we are over time, so that's going to be it. I'll see you guys next day, and tomorrow we will definitely, I've only got like three or four left, we'll definitely hit the end of the physiology questions, and then we'll be entering the next category. So thank you all for watching. See you tomorrow, guys.